Hi there, this is Crystal Beasley. I am here at Augmented World Expo to talk to Tom Furness, one of the godfathers of VR. He's been researching in this area for 50 years. That's right, five zero. Let's talk to him today about what his vision for the future is. Well, my name is Tom Furness, and I am the founder of the Virtual World Society, but I'm also a professor at the University of Washington in the College of Engineering, and also the director of several laboratories, one in uh, Seattle, one in uh, New Zealand, and one in Australia. And uh, I've been involved in developing virtual reality for 52 years, and augmented reality. As a matter of fact, they were all one. <laughs> when I started working on it, we didn't differentiate between virtual reality and augmented reality. And um, so the first part of my career, 23 years, was working for the Department of Defense. I was basically developing these uh, new tools, uh, head mounting tracking systems, uh, helmet mounted displays, uh, ways to interface with cockpits, basically building a cockpit that you wear, and what we call now call virtual reality. So I did that for 23 years, and that's where the basis of virtual reality really started through those years. And um, in the end, I built what was called the super cockpit, which is a cockpit that you wear. And you're able to interact with uh, this, these very complex machines um, using natural interfaces. And we found that we were able to get tremendous bandwidth in the brain in doing that. And in 1989, I left uh, the military establishment and uh, became an academic. I beat my sword into a plowshare to become um, a professor at the University of Washington set up a laboratory called the HIT Lab, Human Interface Technology Lab, that would work on this technology beyond what I was doing for the military, for education and medicine and training and for um, enterprise applications, entertainment applications, scientific visualization, all of these areas. And so in total, I've been working on it for 52 years. That's amazing. Um, and <laughs> many call you the godfather of VR. <laughs> well, I've been called a number of things. <laughs> um, uh, one person called me the Dumbledore of, uh, of uh, virtual reality or the grandfather or whatever. But uh, I've just been around a long time and been lucky to be able to work on this. And the, th the situation is that once you get uh, experienced with VR, you're addicted to it. And so you can't let it go. It sticks with you and you're going to die with it. You know, it's like this disease that works on you uh, throughout your life. Is there any hardware breakthrough that you think is that we're close to that's going to meaningfully change what we're able to do? Well, certainly the, we have all these different modalities we're concerned about. The visual modality, audition, tactile or uh, haptics, uh, taste, smell, these other, other modalities. And um, I think there are two ways to look at this. One is, of course, the hardware technology that basically provides the stimulation to our end organs. And uh, certainly from a display standpoint, we are really not uh, uh, making anything uh, dramatically that's different than what we did, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's just that it's cheaper and a little higher resolution and things like that because of the advent of the smartphones and things like that. Mm -hmm. But really the breakthrough technology is where we actually intimately connect photons with the retina. And uh, one of the, the breakthrough technologies is the virtual retinal display. Uh, where we scan micro lasers, low energy lasers directly on the retina of the eye, and then we can not only provide high resolution, wide field of view displays, but high luminance. And um, this is breakthrough, and it uh, ultimately will cost much less than what we're doing today. But it's been around for a while. My patents that, I, I, that were issued um, are now expired. But we see companies like Magic Leap who are actually using those same technologies. And so we'll see the emergence and out in the marketplace of, of these direct retinal projection light wave technologies coming up soon. So from a visual standpoint, um, we, will, we will see those happening. From an audition, uh, audition standpoint, we have uh, we've had binaural sound for a number of years. And digital signal processing lets us do that to be able to take individual ear prints and be able to make sound which is localized. And so we will see more of that now coming into VR. We haven't seen so much yet, but that will happen. Is that ambisonic sound? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's um, the, the thing is we have uh, in, a, natural, in a natural environment. Of course, we have, we have sound that comes in from all directions. 
and the way our ears process that information, we are able to localize where they are. But it also gives us a sense of presence. When you're in a virtual reality where you don't have sound, even though you feel like you're immersed, it's not the same as right. if you have the ambient uh, sound that would come if you were actually in, in that world. And, uh, and then, of course, there are the haptics, the touch um, and the tactile feedback in terms of providing the stimulation to the, the, um, the sensors uh, that we have, the nerve endings we have in our, in our fingers and our hands and in our, our face and our back of our neck, small of our back, bottom of our feet, all those kind of things are also, we have so many um, receptors in the largest organ of our body, which is our skin. And so we are not, you know, even coming close to stimulating those and making use of them. But all of those contribute to the sense of presence. We do have sensors that will uh, be able to de uh, um, deliver to us uh, fragrances, smells, and things like that, uh, where we can um, look at the eigenvalues of smell and combine those in a way that we're able to deliver them. But smell is interesting because it is, uh, you habituate rapidly with smell. And um, so it changes, only when cha smell changes do you notice that difference. But uh, the olfactory bulb, bulb is just an extension of the brain. So the stimulation of smell really does solicit memory. So it is a very powerful uh, technique depending upon what you're trying to do with the technology. Now taste is going to be a little more difficult. How do you stimulate the, um, the receptors there? Some people say, well, let's not even go to, through those receptors. Let's go directly to the brain with direct brain-computer interfaces. Well, we don't want to do that invasively. So whatever we come up with, we have to do from the outside in. And that is daunting. Uh, anytime we want to provide direct stimulation to the brain um, with uh, something that's outside, that's, that's difficult to do. So there are a number of these technologies that are coming along. <clears throat> I would say that probably the, the biggest ones we're going to see is, is a combination of, of wide field of view, high resolution displays, like with the laser projection. Um, and with uh, eye tracking that helps us provide a much more interactive uh, tool, uh, and then the sound that we add to that. And with those, that combination, we'll get, uh, you know, 95% of the way there. Uh, the other 5% comes from the other, and, and it depends upon what you're trying to do. So my specific interest is about how we will control immersive computing once we We've gotten rid of the keyboard. Uh, we're getting rid of sort of the touchscreen displays, and we don't have a game controller either. So, how will we use the body, and what sort of hardware will we need to pick up those inputs? Well, certainly the uh, Im the ability to interact naturally in a virtual environment is what we're looking for. You shouldn't have to hold anything. We want to put down the controller. That's right. <laughs> we don't want to have to hold anything to do that. Because in the natural world, like I am now, gesturing, I'm pointing at things, I'm looking at things, um, and uh, that's the way that we should be working in, in VR. And uh, we're getting there. Uh, we're getting that with, uh, with the cameras that um, let us um, track depth. I mean, the Kinect camera did some of that. Uh, early on, but they're getting better. And um, I believe that we will be able to recognize hand and finger position and, and uh, other limb positions and things like that and use that along with speech. That's another thing we could do. You say, I want to go over there, um, or I want to pick up this object here. Or, for example, if we are scanning a real environment and we now are parsing and segmenting that to put in a virtual world, we can help train the computer to say, okay, this is a chair, this is a bucket, uh, this is a flower vase. And then what will happen is the computer now takes that segmentation and assigns a meaning to it, which now it's like more the real world. We are able to interact with these objects like we would in the real world. We know that we can pick up the, the vase from the table and, uh, or we can drink the water, the virtual water that's in the glass, things like that. I want to talk a little bit about your work with uh, learning and the, the living room that's going to take the place of our very outmoded classrooms. Um, do you think about that in terms of embodied cognition and the, the spatial aspects of learning? The, the key to um, learning in virtual reality is the spatial aspect because it turns out our memory really does have a spatial address space. I mean, that's the way we remember things. The ancient the Greeks, even, used the method of loci 
in order to remember things. They would memorize long passages, and they would do that by putting themselves in a mind palace. And they would walk around the mind palace, and that would key various these various memories. Well, if we have this ability to have a structure for knowledge, uh, a spatial structure for knowledge, for example, when we learn something, we learn it in context with a uh, spatial address space. Let's say that we, um, on the fly, we're building a mind map. Uh, we do mind maps, you know, in two dimensions. But what if we could do not only mind maps in three dimensions, but do them in VR so that we are creating basically a structure for our knowledge? And so when we learn a particular topic, we assign it to the, one of the stalls in our barn or into the silo or in the paddock. And so as we're learning these things, we place those bits and pieces as we're taking notes in those spaces. Wow, we'll never forget things that way. And it becomes a platform for learning. And it's tapping the thing that VR lets us do. And that is, that's placeness. Because VR puts a place inside of us by putting us in a place. And so that we remember those things. We remember places. So I believe it will unlock a lot of the capability we have in our minds and be able to help us uh, learn a lot faster and, and retain better. Now, there's one other aspect of this, too, and that's the no notion of flow. Uh, we know from um, the psychology of optimal experience from Akali uh, Chinsit Mahali and the work that he did that um, what we really want to get into in terms of a learning system is to get in a flow state. Because when we're in a flow state, we can learn up to maybe seven times faster than we could normally and retain that. And I believe that we can build a flow state generator in VR that helps focus our attention on various things to help us learn faster and also then retain because of these other, other things we're talking about. But in the end, I believe that we need to be turning our living rooms into classrooms. And VR lets us do that because we can go places, we can go on expeditions as a family. One of the things I mentioned yesterday was the idea of a family piloting a starship. And each of the family members have a role to play in that starship, but then once you get to a place where you're interested in investigating, will it support life using astrobiology principles and things like that? The family could actually go down to that planet and do that exploration. How fun would that be? and what you would learn in the process. And it doesn't have to be a starship. It can be going back in history. It can be uh, going inside the body, a virtual body, and things like that. So um, uh, the technology that we ha already have available and will be augmented when we get virtual reality would be a marvelous classroom, and we have it right in our homes. Now, this won't take the place of schools, but really the best classroom in the world should be the home anyway. Lovely. Okay, so last question. What do you believe, but you can't prove it yet? What do I believe, but I can't prove it yet? Yeah. What are the insights that are simmering on the back burner? Wow, that's a great question. Well, I believe that um, we're only scratching the surface in terms of the way humans communicate. I think that we're, we're thinking that uh, this is all done with photons and vibrations in the air and things like that. But I think there's a lot more going on. I'm, I'm fascinated with uh, this whole notion of uh, uh, quantum mechanics in the brain, quantum enhancement. Because the physicists and, uh, are beginning to show that there are very interesting structures in the biophysicists, very interesting structures in the brain that, that provide this avenue for quantum tunneling in the brain. And uh, this means that uh, if there, uh, there's the possibility then of entanglement with other objects out in the world. And we see some of those same structures in plants and leaves and things like that. I believe that we have more connections than we think. We have connections to each other. We have connections to nature. And um, that the way we think affects that. Because in our thinking processes, our cognitive processes, we're sending out signals. And those signals are received through some of this quantum tunneling, possibly, mechanism or entanglement. And they are received and interpreted and affect what's out there. So this may sound a little uh, flaky, but I believe if you hate a person, you're killing them. Because you're sending out signals that are actually picked up. 
Uh, same is true with plants, interacting with all life forms, that we have to realize that there's a stewardship that we have in the way we think because we want not to kill. We want to enhance, love, grow, things like that. Now, we haven't proven that. Uh, we, don't, we haven't measured uh, the, the, this, uh, whatever this quantum connection is, but I believe it's there. But it just takes time to prove it. It's there. There's so much evidence that there's something going on. Well, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the time we have for now. Okay. Thank you Fantastic. So much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Everything's okay. I'm just trying to act right. Everything's okay.